Welcome. Uh, does anybody actually know what the music was that's been playing for the last 15 minutes, 47 seconds? My phone does. What does your phone say? Says, Yes. <laughs> and the track cycle? Uh, you shouldn't do that. Correct. So <laughs> the issue is which of these shouldn't you do? And hopefully by the end of this session you'll have an opinion. Um, okay, you've got a bit of time to see that. Um, Groovy is a programming language, I think we don't we sort of take that for granted really. Um, I will just point out that um, when I first wrote this talk I thought it was an hour long. I got here and realised it was 45 minutes, therefore I had to trim by 15 minutes, so I've taken out all the jokes. <laughs> <laughs> Groove is dynamic. Um, interesting phrase that. Uh, dynamic has many, many meanings in the English language, so you can parse that in at least three or four different ways. Um, and we could have made lots of jokes out of that, but we won't. The problem is that um, dynamism and performance rarely go hand in hand. We actually find that most people who are interested in performance languages and performance computing think that the only good thing is Fortran. Um, well, actually, they sort of relate a bit in the C++ as well. What they wouldn't think of doing is grooving. And where is Groovy used? Well, how many of you guys are actually web-focused? <coughs> right, so just about half. So what are the rest of you guys doing if it's not web? With Groovy. Because <laughs> I thought Grails was the... Oh, no, no, that's a different talk. Um, so what are the other guys doing who aren't doing web things? Data analysis? Pipelines. Sorry? Computational pipelines. Computational pipelines. So definitely not IO-bound. <laughs> so if you're actually doing anything that's I.O. bound, performance isn't going to be your major issue. Um, but if you're doing anything CPU bound, um, performance really is going to be the focus that you're interested in. And Groovy is a complete and total failure when it comes to doing anything with performance because the data types that it uses have no relationship to hardware data types. Any time you see anything that looks like a floating point, it will be big decimal. And big decimal is the exact antithesis of performance. It will produce numbers to any arbitrary precision and accuracy, but it will take a few years to do that. Now, I'm going to have to introduce the example early. I only have one example. I've been living on this for seven years, um, but it has not yet failed me in providing a good example for each and every talk, and that is pi. And we need to know the value of pi. And oh damn, I left a joke in. Never mind. Um, <laughs> and I thought the uh, the last time I tried to to do some uh, English television humour, it failed dismally. But I knew there were going to be one or two English folks here, so I thought I'd leave that, that one in. Um, that one's failed completely. And I took out the picture of the meerkat. <laughs> so, approximating pi, um, you find any, any book of mathematics will give you lots and lots of formulae with conic sections and so on. I've just picked one out here. Computers can't do um, integral equations particularly well. We need to do some form of approximation. So we can take that integral equation and turn it into something that a computer can help us with. And that's doing sums. Uh, it's very good at that. So what's the diagram down there? Well, roughly the idea is you're finding the area under a curve and the integral equation is finding the exact area under the curve. The approximation uh, that you're doing here is to draw rectangles inside the curve and then sum the area of the rectangles. And that would give you a, an approximation to the area. And the, the computer's fairly good at doing width times height, and then adding them all up. But when you've got three here, um, that doesn't seem like a big problem. Normally, we think in terms of 
10 to the 7 or 10 to the 9 little rectangles to try and get a really good approximation to the area. So that's setting the scene of what we're doing. Um, performance is always going to involve some form of parallelism. And um, why is this going to help us? Well, lots of nice maths names here. Commutative and associative operations basically means you can carve up additions however you want and you will get the same result. Obviously, that's mathematical. <coughs> if you do this on a computer, then you will get errors uh, because computers can't add two floating point numbers together correctly. You always get some error involved. And if you want to worry about those errors, you go and do a three-year course in numerical analysis and you get a certificate and then you come back and say, actually, it doesn't matter. Because all that matters is you're getting a rough approximate value and you know that you can do statistical analysis on this and create samples and take means and standard deviations and do all that sort of stuff to gain levels of confidence. And I had hoped to do all that for this conference, but sadly, um, my computer and uh, GBench didn't get together well enough to perform all the nice data samples I needed. So I had to do a quick uh, rewrite of the um, presentation of the data we've got here um, and do some more data gathering over the next couple of months. So at a future conference we'll get the follow-up to this with hard data and the sort of footnote is that um, uh, no, I'll leave that as a, um, a signpost to get people to go to all the groovy conferences that are going to happen over the next year. Pretty diagram, but it's basically about <coughs> scatter gather, um, Hadoop, uh, MPI, lots and lots of frameworks for doing all this sort of stuff. But the issue was big decimal, and that's going to be a sort of sequential issue. I will have to actually put my glasses on so I can see this sort of thing down here. And if we go to, um, oh, just rearrange yourself. What's happening at that? Thank you. Now, how's the font size for the folks at the back? Is that roughly okay? Yeah, that's fine. Cool. Um, what we've got here is a sequential um, piece of code, and IntelliJ and JetBrains would like to apologise for the blue lozenge that keeps getting in the way. I have no idea how to turn it off. Mm -hmm. It will keep coming back from time to time. So here we've just got a sequential piece of code, um, takes the time, does a loop, so it's creating that value, and then we add them all together, and we do it <coughs> 10 to the, well the game's given away here, so it's going to be really rather slow. Uh, in well let's find out how quick it's going to be, because uh, it's this one here, so if we just actually run it, and it, it's going to take a second and a bit. Um, so, you know, it got 3.14159265535. It's going wrong somewhere around here. There's a bit of accuracy going. But we've got seven or eight significant digits. That's quite good. Took us 1.12 seconds, and we've done 10,000 iterations. In Java, we're looking at 10 to the 9 in roughly the same sort of time. So, this is incredibly slow. But let's actually prove the slowness of it, by doing in Groovy um, the only thing you can do to get any form of performance in this, and that's to stick types on everything. So that's anti-rule one of dynamic programming, is putting types everywhere to force a type system. We're not too worried about any um, type conversions that are going on up here. What we're worried about is the core in here. Is this going to do the job? Well, let's find out. So, uh, put glasses on. You must remember not to take them off. So, it should be. Uh, I've done the wrong one, have I? No? Yes, I have done the wrong one. It's this piece down here that we want. So, it will tell us that um, we're doing um, the primitives one here with lots and lots of type annotations in there, 
And very, very importantly, you've got to annotate all the, all the literals. Otherwise, you'll end up with big decimals in here. And double minus big decimal gives you a big decimal. Big decimal times anything gives you big decimal. And if you've ever tried to do big decimal, you will know how painful it is. Okay, so seven seconds for 10 to the 9, roughly Java speed. Actually, um, I think this is actually slightly faster than Java. That's because Jochen has optimised the heck out of loops used in this sort of way. And that has surprised many people that Java, dynamic Java, and apparently they're as fast as Java. Um, because I don't have the samples and the means and the standard deviations, I can't stand up here and say, we have a proof of that. It's still just indicators. Sadly, though, Scala's even faster, which is really, really rather annoying. <laughs> <laughs> so, have we proven that Groovy is useless? Sort of. Because this is the sort of Groovy you want to write. If you're in an I.O. bound context, fine. If you're in a CPU bound context, this is the sort of Groovy you end up having to write. Mm, no frowns yet. <laughs> okay, so we did the code. Now that was sequential. There was sort of one core working on this thing. Um, what we really want is some parallelism, concurrency and parallelism and stuff like that. Because we live really in a multi-core world. Um, how many people's laptops have got eight cores? Green Lindsay. I bought this machine especially because it was an i7. i7, four cores. Yeah. It tells Linux it's four cores, but it isn't. It's two cores, each with two hyperthreads. And anybody who knows anything about microbenchmarking will tell you that in general, hyperthreads are a pain in the you really don't want to know about it. So, this machine tells Linux it's got four cores. We will see that it's actually only really got two. What's the way of accessing this physical hardware? We're on the JVM. JVM has threads. Those threads then map down to kernel threads. And we access real parallelism through that route. And so how many people actually do shared memory multi-threaded program? Do you like doing? No. no. Correct answer. <laughs> um, really, um, shared memory multi-threading should only be seen as an infrastructure technique. It is a way of providing a different API to people. Um, the only people who should actually be worrying about this sort of thing are the likes of folks doing Java Util Concurrent, um, which is good, mostly. The problem with Java Util Concurrent is a lot of the classes and packages in there are for infrastructure, and so like uh, all the atomic integers and atomic decimals and all that sort of stuff. And lots of them are for general users, like concurrent hashing. And you have to know which of the classes are the right ones to be using at the application <coughs> layer and which ones to use only for infrastructure building. So do be careful of that, but good stuff. <laughs> Even better now that uh, we're in. Whoops. Sorry. Java 8 land. We like Java 8 land. Java and Util Concurrent just got a whole lot better. But of course, you guys get GPARS, um, which is basically a Java 5 and Java 6 version of Java 8. So the idea is that uh, you're not going to need it anymore. Except that you will, because there are things in GPARS like Dataflow and CSP 
things like that that haven't yet made it in Java. Um, but hopefully, eventually, it will. So you can use concurrency flyer. Do people using GPARs and Grails and things like that for concurrency? Is it concurrency or parallelism that you're after? Uh, parallelism. You're after parallelism, yeah. yeah. You can use it for concurrency alone. One thread and multiple activities going on, you share the thread between them. But in the main, you are looking to access those calls underneath. You are looking to shorten the time of your execution by using all of the resources that you have on your system. And so those of us with eight core machines are damned lucky because they can get the job done eight times faster. That's linearities. One of the things about, the, one of the key words that was on the slide earlier was embarrassingly parallel. The sort of data parallel problem that we saw there, the scatter, gather. Uh, you should be able to do a problem eight times faster if it's got eight cores. This thing, okay, it's got four cores. It hasn't, it's only got two. So we're only going to see things going twice as far. If I had a reliable internet connection to home, I would actually do the demos on my workstation at home, which is a twin Xeon. So it's got eight real cores and um, a word beginning with F followed by fast. <laughs> and that's the point. Parallelism is about performance. If you take the trouble to parallelize your code and it doesn't go any faster, hash fail. Because the only reason for using parallelism is to make things go faster. And that's why it's much less relevant in an I.O. bound context than it is in a compute bound context. So talking about parallelism and performance, make sure you're in the right context for talking in those terms. So we actually should look at a little bit more code, and I will try and remember to leave the glasses on and not take them off. Okay, so, um, no, I need to move that one out of the way, press that button. Um, what have we got? Well, we've done the big decimal, um, so everything else is assuming the primitive. So there's, there's not multiples going on here. But what can we do with these uh, parallels? And streams coming up, just as a sort of little signpost. Um, but we've got GPARs up here. We can do lots of interesting things with GPARs. And so we can see um, code, code's looking a bit like this. Okay, where you say you want to use some form of uh, thread pool. And so what is that actually doing? Well, it's connecting in the standard fork join framework underneath, which is a very sensible thing to do. It's a damn good piece of in infrastructure. So let's make use of it. And the job of the fork join pool is to separate your threads from the kernel threads underneath. Is to make use of the JVM threads to implement, to sorry, to animate more than one of your threads, the application threads. And so it separates those apart from each other. That's necessary. We need to use one real thread amongst many of our tasks. So we'll call them tasks for now. So we get ourselves a thread pool, and within that thread pool we can do interesting things. So one of them is collect parallel. So we've moved into a much more functional way of thinking about these already in order to get hold of these ideas. We're saying, here's a number range. Um, let me actually stop waving in the air and point them out on here. We've got ourselves here a number range. Whoops, not doing too well here. We have straight lines. So do it properly. We have ourselves a number range here. So that's generated an iterable. You can iterate over it, and collect parallel does exactly that. It iterates over the iterable, putting things in different threads. 
according to some algorithm or other, with a pool of the default is the number of calls. So if I don't actually manage the uh, thread pool, um, it will come up with the number of calls that is reported to the operating system, <coughs> which isn't always what you want. Um, so I suppose the, the bit of giveaway really is what's this function doing? Um, so we better open that one up and have a look. Mm -hmm. oh, I have to keep pressing pause. I don't know why they may pause the, uh, the control flow. Oh, there we go. So there's our dynamic compile. We've been careful to annotate all the literals to make sure we don't get any unforeseen use of big decimal or big integer if we're really unlucky. But it's basically the code transplanted out. But you'll notice that we're only doing a slice. Remember with the A plus B plus C plus D? And we could put in parentheses and have an A plus B plus C plus D. Well, the slice is the A plus B in parentheses. We're doing part of the job. We're creating a partial sum, which we then send back, and all the partial sums get added together. And that's the scatter gap. So you scatter uh, for the partial sums, and then you gather for summing the partial sums. <coughs> also called map reduce, uh, not map reduce, but map reduce. They're a very different thing. Not enough people using Google stuff. <laughs> okay, um, fairly straightforward. Fairly okay. Non-commercial. Okay. We're going to run it, aren't we? Yeah, we've got to run it. So, um, which one did, which one did I click in the end? Uh, GPARS, GPARS pool, dynamic. That one. So we better run it. And it's going to run for one, two, eight, and thirty-two threads in the pool. And so what we would be expecting if we had 32 processors, which would be nice on the laptop, but probably a bit warm. So we'd expect some relationship of x, half x, 8x, 32x, if we had 32 cores. You can only go to the maximum of the number of cores you've got. So on the 8-core machine over there, you would go 1, 2, 8, 8. On this machine, you go one, two, two, two. <laughs> which doesn't really make for a really great demonstration. But one, two, two, two. Are we getting any faster? Well, if I've got the samples and the means and the standard deviations and I've done the analysis of variance, we'd have been able to say yes or no with some statistical significance. I mean, using a e less than 0 0.05 or something like that. But because we haven't had the sample, I don't have the samples um, that have been analysed, um, all we can say is that there is an indicator that we've got 1, 2, 2, 2. So therefore it's worth doing the experiment properly. Okay, so that's dynamic. What about uh, this other one? Just sort of throwing in, as it were. And we're getting far too many of these things. Someone here is that projector does not like this laptop. So instead of getting 1200 by 800, um, we're at 1024 by 768, which is fine for slides and useless for this sort of job. But never mind. So what's the difference between the, this code and the previous code? Um, not a lot. Um, it's the word static in there instead of dynamic. So what that means is that we are pulling on this partial sum here. And the only difference between it and the lower one is at compile static. So dynamic code, 
static code. Properly type checked, properly bytecode generated, um, etc., etc., etc. So we have to run it. Uh, I've gone too far, haven't I? GPARS pool static. So we run that one. And we get the same 12832. It will go 1222 because the hardware lies to Linux. He thinks this is something we have to investigate. Remember, we don't have statistics, so we can't have any confidence in an actual statement. All we can say is that we've built an hypothesis that says something damn weird is going on here. <laughs> so, further investigation needed. But with larger numbers of threads in the pool, we do appear to have the one, two that we've been roughly expecting. I think, well, I'm, again, I don't have the statistical evidence to back that up, I think the lack of apparent difference between the compile static and the dynamic is the amount of work that has gone in to optimising that within the JVM. But that is hypothesis. So I've got no data to back that up. But it's a good place to start and think about the problem. If we use for uh, int i in start dot dot end, then you wouldn't go anywhere near the start because that's not as well optimised in the JVM or on the JVM. So we looked at some more code. Are you bored yet? <laughs> no. Okay. Good. And so the, the sort of the thesis was really that dynamism and parallelism just don't go together. And yet we've got an indication that, as far as we're concerned, dynamic groovy goes just as fast as static groovy. And just as fast, we've made the claim, as Java. Hmm, novel. So we've done the compile static bit, or introduced the compile static bit. Um, it is about leaving the dynamism, getting rid of it. And it's therefore about performance. So should you be using compile static in an I.O. bound context? I leave that to you. But I suspect the answer is context. Performance only matters when you're CPU bound. So don't worry about it. Um, yeah, let's take a little detour into Invoke Dynamic. So who uses the indie library? Two of us, three of us. Uh, does anybody know how to use the indie library? <laughs> well, two more. Yeah. Um, what I do um, is when I do a local installation of Groovy, is I remove all the non-indie libraries and point to the indie libraries from where the non-indie libraries should be. So I don't get a choice. I'm always using the indie library. But you actually have to switch them on. You don't get uh, indie behaviour by default. So, um, oh, damn, I was about to say I'm going to be dangerous. But <laughs> UK television humour doesn't actually translate. So we'll have to miss that joke out. Um, so let's go, ooh, no, wrong place. We want to be somewhere in here. And we need to... Uh, Change the profile so that you can actually see the uh, letters. So we are here. Here are all those files that uh, we've been playing with. Um, let's not worry about the parallelism for a minute. Let's just run this one as per normal. So it's just picking up the Groovy from the path, which is Groovy 2.3 snapshot built about four days ago. Um, again, I've not risked rebuilding on here. 
just in case it all went wrong. Uh, trying to minimise risk. Okay, so we've got the same number as we did earlier. And what we do now is try running it groovy minus indie. So this should now switch to using the uh, invoke dynamic mechanisms rather than the traditional ways of doing it. Well, that looks pretty cool. You appear to have uh, not lost anything. Again, I can't say whether they're equal because I don't have the statistic to back up such a claim. But the hypothesis looking like invoke dynamic is no longer problematic. It had been a bit problematic before, hadn't it? And Jochen's been working quite hard on it, hasn't he? Yes, but basically the problem is that you get said it's broken. <laughs> ah, I forgot to tell people. You know um, JDK8? Are you on it yet? Why not? It was released on March the 18th. It's now allowed to be used, even in organisations. Um, so I've been using JDK8 since I think release 69, um, when it was really a bit of a beast. And uh, it kept changing from time to time. But I'm running two, Groovy 2.3 on JDK8, where Invoke Dynamic actually works. So if you do want to use Invoke Dynamic and get this sort of a result, use JDK8. If you use JDK7, you will get a yo-yo of -yo a result. It, it will get, give you random answers in terms of the performance. Um, I guess we should just try um, pi of g pars. Uh, which one were we using? Pool, I think, wasn't it? Um, g pars pool. Um, dynamic. Just to run that one here. Uh, not too bad, not too bad. What about Indy? Because our variable here is Indy versus not Indy. We're not too worried about the scaling at the moment. It's not what we're checking. So if we uh, groovy minus Indy that. Ooh. 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 He thinks we like. This is looking a teensy weensy bit quicker. Excellent. So compile static didn't appear to do anything. But in invoke dynamic now on JDK8 may well be doing something for us in the performance state. I had hoped at this point to have a nice table with results and just point at things to say, yes, it is. Faster. But you know, there is a very small probability, just like there's a probability that this device will spontaneously appear on the other side of the wall, that this is not true. Okay, so we've, we've tackled issues of using parallelism, G pars up picked out one of them, there are lots of others we could play with, but we only have a small amount of time. Um, we'll be hanging around this evening, if anyone wants to have a chat, feel free. We just, we just need a Spanish speaker at a restaurant somewhere. No, never mind, that one didn't work. <laughs> Java 8, um, you will like Java 8. You will like Java 8. <laughs> Um, if you think Java 8 is anything like Java 0 through 7, you are wrong. Uh, Java 8 is the greatest revolution in Java that has been since 1993. Um, and Java 5 is just a drop in. Someone mentioned Java 1.4 earlier in one of the talks. Oh, yeah. yeah, some poor sods are still using it for production because the accountants won't let them change. Anyway, there, there are masses of things in Java 8. It's, uh, it's a three-hour session itself. The only ones that really matter for us today, Lambda expressions, that's the only one that actually matters in this particular case. And the consequence that comes out of it all, which is streams. So 
what I want to do is to go back to Java for a short while and have a look. Let's, um, so slightly different beastie here. Here's, here's a Java 7 uh, sort of thing. You know, we have ourselves an executor. We get ourselves an array list that we're going to put futures in. Um, if words like executor and futures are unfamiliar to you and you're doing I.O. bound, that's fine. If you're doing CPU bound and the terms are not familiar, you need to do a quick brush up with the, with the manuals. And so what I'm doing here is just using the callable, which is um, a runnable that can return a value. So we're creating these futures sticking them onto a data structure so we've got a handle on them, letting them go and do their computation. The thread pool underneath then manages the threads <coughs> against the cores underneath. And then we have to go through all this palaver to, um, to get hold of the values. So we need to block at some point saying we need the value. And the act of blocking in Java 7 uses these things that should never have existed, which is called exceptions are the bane of my life. <laughs> and I think you can see why. Yeah. This is just, oh, it's just horrible. <laughs> why should I have to care about execution? What the heck is execution exception anyway? Okay, rant over. I'll pass. Now, I've calmed down. <laughs> but that's the Java 7 way of doing this particular problem. So how are we going to do it in Java 8? Okay, so we start off with a stream. We have a range. Okay? We then tell the world we want to have a parallel range. If I take the word parallel out, it's sequential. If I put a parallel in, it's parallel. How cool is that? <coughs> and then I'm going to map my integers that I have here into some object. And that object is going to be a completable feature. This thing here is asynchronous function call. So you call a function, or in this case, a closure. And well, it's not quite a closure, it's a lambda expression. Um, but you say, well, I don't care how you do it, just go away and do it and give me a future. And I'll, I'll synchronise on the futures. Um, and then we map our um, futures by synchronising, and that gives us some values, and then we sum the values. This is just such fluent APIs type thing. It's a sort of quasi-functional program. Um, if you are using data structures in Java 8, you are using functional programming. If you are not, you are doing it wrong. Uh, this is not a good solution. This is actually a bad answer. Naughty track. And why is it a bad answer? Because we've gone from a Java 7 solution, which was more or less okay as a Java 7 solution, and we've tried to transplant it into Java 8. And we've tried to be careful in using the new Java 8 things, because they're new, they're shiny, therefore good. No, that one didn't quite work. Never mind. <laughs> um, but we're actually still blocking. The whole point about streams is you avoid blocking. You have a reduce operation at the end and just let the reduce operation do all the work. In other words, not only do we put the threads into the infrastructure, we try and put all the synchronization into the infrastructure as well. <coughs> so what would be a good Java 8 solution? Well, I would claim this one's not half... Uh, yeah, that one's not half bad. I was worried there for a moment I clicked the wrong one. <coughs> so again, we've got a stream. You know, that's just like arranging, grooving. Say parallel, map to double. 
sun. Let the stream do print the value. What's going on under the covers, of course, it's all working with iterables, and it's just doing a um, use-on-demand approach to the iterable. And so the pipeline is as lazy as possible with it going on. But at the end, you have some form of collector object that actually causes everything to be pulled through, and the sum itself will do that. And so, okay, we've got to be performing some way. We've got to actually run this thing. Well, it's not worse. No, definitely not worse. Is it better? Well, do we actually care whether it's better or not? As long as it's not worse. Which would you prefer to have done? The Java 7 solution or the Java 8 solution? Given that the performance looks roughly the same, would you prefer to manage this code or this code? The later. Well, obviously, given the way I'm presenting it, <laughs> my answer is South Africa. Um, and you're thinking, ooh, we like this. So do we just give up on Groovy and get all the rest of it and just go to it in Java? Um, well, that's actually one solution. <coughs> Look, functional programming in Java. Just do it. Or do we say, well, we actually like some of the extra bits in Groovy. Um, so you know, can we do all this in... Um, in Groovy. You bet you can. That's the whole point of Groovy, is that it's the dynamic symbiote of Java. They work together with the same data model. There is no adapters in the way. And so here we are. We are actually in Groovy land using the Streams API from Java 8. Now, if you're thinking, well, doesn't this make a lot of G piles a bit redundant? Uh, yes. Um, a couple of days ago, I took a fork of G piles, called it the JDK8 branch, and deleted the entirety of the parallel arrays from G piles, uh, and then I had to catch a plane. Um, and of course, as you know, you lose connectivity to everything when you catch a plane. Um, so I haven't actually had a chance to find out what the total fallout is. But um, I suspect we're going to be using this sort of stuff in Groovy fairly shortly. Um, if there are some things that I can implement easily over the top of this, they will appear in GPAR. So we're trying to keep as much of the current API as possible, but the idea is to get rid of all the extra 166Y stuff that's in uh, the bundle with GPARs in order to support parallel arrays, because parallel arrays are now dead as far as the Java platform is concerned. Uh, so why should we, with Groovy, continue to use what is seen as a dead platform? And this gives us laziness of the streams for free. Why should we re-implement it? <coughs> so, as I say, we'll try and preserve the API as much as possible, but there's going to be a breaking change in G part coming, exactly because we'll have a JDK8 version and a version for those people who will not upgrade. Ooh, that was a bit close to the mark. I don't know. So, uh, um, oh, we did more codes. That's fine. Um, so, with that, it's sort of G pars needs you, because the JDK8 change to G pars is going to be a revolution in G part. We're going to keep, obviously, the data flow stuff and the uh, CSP stuff because that's not dependent on this. But its implementation underneath may well have to change, in which case it may actually get better than it is now. And so that was going to be my message. Um, hopefully, there's been some interesting stuff in there. Um, and hopefully, you feel you want to come and contribute. It's an open little thing. Just Shut in the pool request. Thank you very much.
think we've probably got time for a couple of questions only, but a couple nonetheless if we're <coughs> floating around. It normally takes about 15 seconds for the first person to have the courage to raise their hand. So I'll waffle for a little while just in case uh, someone's got any questions. No. Okay, so maybe I did overdo technical we're stuff. To, we are going to see this actors. Uh, Sorry? We are going to see this actors. Uh, that are okay, the, the, the question is really are, are we going to be able to see distributed actors in GPARS? Um, the background to that at the moment is that GPARS is purely single machine, or at least single JDM platform. Um, and so it's only using however many cores that are offered to the JDM. I and mean, that was a strategic decision a year and a bit ago to say we've got to get that right first and then we can think about um, distribution. So a couple of years ago there was a, a beginnings of an attempt to use Netty to provide some distributed actors. Sorry? Netty oh, yeah. um, as a, a piece of infrastructure. And we may actually have someone on uh, Groovy Summer of Code this year to have a look at distributed actors in GPARS. And this person's got some good background, so it, this is not going to be a joke G GSOC project. I think it's going to be a good genuine one. It won't end up with product, nor should it. But it would be a really good experiment to find a way forward uh, to doing it well. And at the moment, uh, Vassop and I have not tinkered with it. Um, we've focused entirely on the single JVM stuff today. So not soon, but hopefully it's, it's, we'll, we'll get something. Okay. Thank you. No problem. No, in which case, uh, break time. Uh, was it a 15-minute break? Um, okay, so thank you very much.